gives us the current snapshot. And the mayor turns to voters to keep clearing out dilapidated houses in Detroit because the federal money for it has run out. Today is Sunday, September 13th, 2020, and this is Flashpoint. Hi there, and welcome to Flashpoint after a barn burner of a week on the news front. And as we long expected, Michigan is right in the middle of it. We are now 50 days from Election Day. So, of course, the presumed swing states are now getting more attention than an ice cream truck at a kindergarten. This week, the Michigan visits of both Joe Biden and then Donald Trump were given a dose of rocket fuel by the revelations from the new book from Bob Woodward that shows us a very conflicting, duplicitous, and that's putting it kindly, picture of the president in the pandemic. But... Perhaps you disagree. I again return to the theme I have voiced time and time again on this program. Both sides seem so soldered into their positions. I don't know that the hue and cry move the needle one way or the other. I feel a bit like a modern Diogenes. The Greek philosopher was noted for searching the world over trying to find one honest man. Well, here I am searching the nation over trying to find one undecided voter. Are there any? We're going to talk about that as we discuss the findings from the latest Local 4 Detroit News poll. Richard Zuba says he has never seen voter engagement at the levels we see right now, and our pollster will join me in just a moment. Also, we're going to talk about something else that Detroit voters will find on their ballots should Detroiters pass a bond proposal to keep Mayor Duggan at work tearing down old dilapidated houses and buildings? Or is it a time for tightening belts rather than loosening them? It's all today on Flashpoint. All right, let's start with politics this morning. We released the results of a new poll early last week. And now let's note it was polling done before the events of a rather wild week. But there is in the numbers um, a lot that we expect may not be very changeable, starting with the engagement that voters are feeling, the energy that is pushing them to vote. Joined now by our pollster from the Glen Gareth Group, Richard Zuba, and we've got Nolan Fenley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from Detroit Today on WDET to dig into the findings as well. Richard, let me start with you. Uh, your notes uh, to those of us here at Local 4 about the poll, you've just never seen, uh, you thought you'd never seen higher vo mo voter motivation than in 2018 and yet even higher now. Well, you know what's amazing to me is in 2016, we're having the exact opposite conversation. We are seeing motivation to vote numbers amongst independents that were 5.6 on a 10 point scale. We now see voters motivated at a 9.7 on a 10 point scale. It's the highest level I've seen in 37 years and it's everybody all sides, middle, left, right, everybody is motivated to vote this year. So does that mean then uh, the advantage is spread out and equal or does that uh, kind of motivation favor one candidate over the other when it comes to the presidential race? Well, when you look at Michigan electoral history, large turnouts benefit Democrats. They're, the math is just that there are more Democrats in Michigan than there are Republicans. It's just that Republicans historically are better at turning out and voting in elections. And I think uh, what we're seeing here is if everybody's motivated to vote at equally high levels, the advantage goes to the Democrats uh, and it goes to Joe Biden. Well, uh, whether or not that continues is something we're going to watch for the next six weeks. But certainly we've seen these levels of motivation now since 2018. Well, on the front then uh, of the Democrats and Joe Biden, it's interesting to know all the things that have I mentioned what uh, wasn't included in the polling, just what happened this past week. But we go back to the polling that you did in January, which, of course, didn't include the covid response. Joe Biden's support has remained largely unchanged. And I keep going back time and time again to everybody being, to my way of thinking, cemented into their positions, and I don't see much flow in the middle anywhere. This race feels like it's stuck in cement. And the one, the one finding I took from this survey is the great stability of this race. Despite all the chaos and all the noise, uh, there's been a lot of stability, and Donald Trump's job approval cannot climb above 43%. And we've had him pegged at this 42% number for some time now. And until he can improve his job, job approval with voters, there's no oxygen for him to move. 
And you mentioned what happened this week, and I don't think this week changed anything or changed any opinions. <laughs> that, that, that is astonishing, Nolan. Um, we really mm -hmm. did have, th th this was no longer uh, he said, she said. We, there are tapes this time, and the president was, was caught in a lie about the way that he responded uh, to the coronavirus, and yet nothing moved. Should I be surprised by that? Isn't that astonishing? Well, when has anything moved over the last four years? I mean, we've gone through all sorts of, of uh, scandals, allegations, conspiracy theories, impeachment, and that, improve, that approval number has never moved. I think uh, he has a very solid base of support. The question in Michigan is, can you get that base of support over 50 percent? Uh, if, if Michigan holds true to form, I mean, you would never think uh, a Republican presidential candidate would have much of a chance here. And yet John, Donald Trump surprised us in 2016. Question becomes, can he surprise us again? I mean, I don't think any of us sat here in uh, uh, September of 2016 thinking Donald Trump had much of a chance here. In fact, Stephen, uh, I, I, I don't sense, uh, I, I've heard from a few people, but by and large, I don't sense a lot of end zone dancing being done by Democrats, even over what happened the past week. Uh, nothing feels uh, certain. Well, I mean, it's about turnout, as, as Richard said. And what happened in 2016, remember, is not that, um, that Donald Trump turned out more uh, Republican voters uh, than, than past uh, Republican candidates. In fact, he, he got fewer votes uh, than both Mitt Romney and John McCain. Uh, it's that Hillary Clinton was was unable to bring out the Democratic votes who uh, who had given the state to, to Democrats for almost 30 years. Uh, and so the reason Democrats are not uh, calming down now is that they don't want to repeat that. They want to make sure that they have the kind of turnout uh, that, that gives them uh, the chance to win Michigan. And, and that means uh, people in Detroit have got to vote in larger numbers and Democrats in the Detroit suburbs, uh, Oakland County and Macomb, uh, both counties that uh, Barack Obama won, won twice. Uh, you've got to make sure that people show up and actually vote. And of course, there's big questions this year about how those votes get counted and whether they get cast the right way. The mail-in uh, complicates uh, complicates things, and Democrats should be nervous about that. Well, you've teed that up for me quite nicely. That's what I was going to get to next with Richard. Richard, <laughs> according to your polling numbers, 38 percent of the voters that you talk to are planning to vote by mail. 54 percent say they'll be doing it in person at the ballot box. What does that mean ultimately, do you suppose, not just for the counting, uh, but for the ultimate, the way the results turn? Well, first of all, let's talk about the results. I mean, when you look at the people who are voting absentee, Joe Biden has a 68 to 25 percent lead amongst those absentee voters. They are wildly disproportionately Democratic and independent voters. Uh, Republicans are going to the ballot box on Election Day. So those first night, those first votes we're going to see on Election Night are going to be the Republican votes that come in. And we have to remember that. Uh, but it also, you know, creates a strange dynamic on election night if those clerks aren't allowed to prepare those absentee ballots ahead of time, where we're going to have Donald Trump looking like he's winning big, and suddenly those absentee votes come in, and Joe Biden just sweeps ahead. And I think that's a big problem for us to deal with. Nolan, uh, uh, there are a number of Republicans I've talked to who believe it was a real mistake for the president to go after mail-in voting, that uh, it kind of was a chilling effect on Republicans doing the very same thing which he needs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they should be out there doing just what, you know, Democrats are doing, you know, get a, a absentee ballot and have hands of every dead Republican they could find. You know, it's a curious <laughs> strategy. But, you know, you look at this, and once again, the, the similarities to 216 that I see is, once again, Democrats are counting on Donald Trump to turn out their voters. Even Joe Biden isn't talking about Joe Biden. It's all about Donald Trump. And I believe the challenge for Democrats is to build enthusiasm beyond just voting against Donald Trump. They've got to build some, some excitement about voting for Joe Biden. That remains a problem, doesn't it, Stephen? Uh, it does, uh, but already you're seeing some really different strategy this time than you saw in 2016. I mean, Joe Biden was here in the state of Michigan uh, this week. Uh, Hillary Clinton did not come to Michigan, I believe, in the last uh, nine or ten months. Rather uh, famously, yes. Uh, or Wisconsin. 
of the or or go into Wisconsin, uh, another place that, uh, that that Biden has his eyes on. Uh, I, I think it's going to be hard to compare um, the performance or the strategy and the campaign uh, four years ago to, to this year. I think Democrats are not going to make the same mistakes. The question is going to be about Election Day and, and how uh, people respond and, and how many people actually show up to vote or uh, if they cast those votes uh, by mail in, if they're going to count uh, uh, and if they can get counted ahead, as Richard said. I mean, th those are the real questions. It, it really is about how uh, the balloting goes this year, uh, that's really going to decide what happens uh, in, in terms of uh, the outcome. And, and that's a little different than 2016. Well, I also and you've got to get those ballots in well ahead of Election Day because they have to be in hand. They've got to uh, be there on Election that's Day. That's different from, from some other states. So people who hang on to those ballots until the last day or two or, or week um, risk not having their vote count. It'll be a problem. Uh, I quickly want to also make sure we get to the Senate race here. Uh, Richard, you've got the race, uh, Peters, right now by three, which is inside the margin of error on this. So I guess uh, the general wisdom on this, conventional wisdom on it, would be how goes the presidential race, goes the Senate race. Is that fair? Oh. Well, you know, anybody who thinks this race is done isn't paying attention. This is a very close Senate race right now. And I think if Republicans didn't have so many incumbent senators to defend across the country, they would be pouring a lot more money into this race in Michigan right now. Yeah. But, you know, as we look at the undecided voters in the Senate race, they lean a little disproportionately to the Democratic side. So there's some, some room for Gary Peters to grow. Uh, but he's got to get those people there, and he hasn't yet. So this is a close race, and it's going to continue to be a close race. And, you know, Gary Peters is a first-term U.S. senator. They face tough re-election fights. But I do think as Michigan goes, so will the Senate race. Your thoughts on that, Steve, and what's your worry level over Gary Peters for Democrats? No, I think uh, it's a close race, as Richard said. I, I think a lot of it does owe to the fact that uh, this is uh, Peter's first term, and that first re-election bid is always tougher uh, than than the than the rest of them seem to be. Uh, I also will give credit to John James, who I think is running a much better campaign this time than he did against Debbie Stabenow. Yeah. I see him on television more. I think he is uh, making points that. Uh, that resonate with uh, with some voters, uh, and so uh, Peters is going to have to to fight to to pull this out. Uh, although I do I do think it is it seems very unlikely that uh, that if Biden wins Michigan, that James would win that Senate seat. I think uh, in the end that seems uh, one of the most unlikely outcomes. Uh, Nolan, you do want to learn from experience, and uh, I think a lot of people feel that John James is running a, a different kind and better race this time around than he did against Stabenow. Yeah. Yeah, his messaging is sharper. Um, he's grown some. Um, experience is a wonderful thing when it comes to, to campaigning. And who knows? He's a, a strong, attractive African-American candidate. Maybe he benefits from the Black Lives Movement this time around. At last, he won't even acknowledge the Black Lives Movement for the most part. So, <laughs> and, and, we, and unfortunately, we don't have very many debates that the two have agreed to right now. Only two and not in the most uh, primetime slots. Uh, Richard, lastly, uh, quickly about uh, Gretchen Whitmer's performance. Uh, getting almost two out of every three Michiganders um, supporting the way that she's handled coronavirus. Yeah, she's got 60% job approval here in Michigan. Independents really are on board with her right now. And I say right now because we've seen political leaders have these great leads and these great approval ratings that, you know, dissipate with the next crisis. So she's handling this one well right now. Uh, the one benefit I think that is going to have in November is she is going to play very well with independence in Southeast Michigan in selling both Biden uh, and, and Peters and she will have an influence in these state house races in Oakland County. Men, we got to leave it there. I do want to need to make one quick uh, correction. My producer, Jamie Walters, just reminded me that so far, Peters and James have only actually agreed to one uh, debate together. They both agreed to two, but two different ones. So right now, uh, just one set. Guys, thanks very much. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about Proposal N, which will be on the ballot in Detroit. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.